For a man who has more centuries of tradition behind him than I have, it's odd that Francisco should be the first to break our own tradition. And Mr. Gault? she asked. How many centuries does he have behind him? John. None at all. None behind him. But all of those ahead. Never mind the centuries, said Gault. Tell me what sort of year you've had behind you. Lost any men? No. Lost any of your time? You mean was I wounded? No, I haven't had a scratch since that one time ten years ago when I was still an amateur, which you ought to forget by now. I wasn't in any danger whatever this year. In fact, I was much more safe than if I were running a small-town drug store under Directive 10-289. Lost any battles? No. The losses were all on the other side this year. The looters lost most of their ships to me and most of their men to you. You've had a good year too, haven't you? I know I've kept track of it. Since our last breakfast together, you got everyone you wanted from the state of Colorado and a few others besides, such as Ken Daniger, who was a great prize to get. But let me tell you about a still greater one who is almost yours. You're going to get him soon because he's hanging by a thin thread and is just about ready to fall at your feet. He's a man who saved my life, so you can see how far he's gone. Galt leaned back, his eyes narrowing. So you weren't in any danger whatever, were you? Donna Schuld laughed. Oh, I took a slight risk. It was worth it. It was the most enjoyable encounter I've ever had. I've been waiting to tell you about it in person. It's a story you'll want to hear. Do you know who the man was? Hank Reardon. I... No. It was Galt's voice. It was a command. The brief snap of sound had a tinge of violence neither of them had ever heard from him before. What? asked Donna Schuld softly incredulously. Don't tell me about it now. But you've always said that Hank Reardon was the one man you wanted to see here most. I still do. But you'll tell me later. She studied Galt's face intently, but she could find no clue, only a closed, impersonal look, either of determination or of control, that tightened the skin of his cheekbones and the line of his mouth. No matter what he knew about her, she thought, the only knowledge that could explain this was a knowledge he had had no way of acquiring. You've met Hank Reardon, she asked, turning to Donna Schuld. And he saved your life? Yes. I want to hear about it. I don't, said Galt. Why not? You're not one of us, Miss Taggart. I see. She smiled with a faint touch of defiance. Were you thinking that I might prevent you from getting Hank Reardon? No, that was not what I was thinking. She noticed that Donischold was studying Galt's face, as if he too found the incident inexplicable. Galt held his glance, deliberately and openly, as if challenging him to find the explanation, and promising that he would fail. She knew that Donischold had failed when she saw a faint crease of humor, softening Galt's eyelids. What else, asked Galt, have you accomplished this year? I've defied the law of gravitation. You've always done that. In what particular form now? In the form of a flight from mid-Atlantic to Colorado in a plane loaded with gold beyond the safety point of its capacity. Wait till my deceased the amount I have to deposit. My customers this year will become richer by... Say, have you told Miss Taggart that she's one of my customers? No, not yet. You may tell her if you wish. I'm... What did you say I am? she asked. Don't be shocked, Miss Taggart, said Donna Schuld, and don't object. I'm used to objections. I'm a sort of freak here anyway. None of them approve of my particular method of fighting our battle. John doesn't. Dr. Axton doesn't. They think that my life is too valuable for it. But, you see, my father was a bishop, and of all his teachings there was only one sentence that I accepted. All they that take the sword shall perish with the sword. What do you mean? that violence is not practical. If my fellow men believe that the force of the combined tonnage of their muscles is a practical means to rule me, let them learn the outcome of a contest in which there's nothing but brute force on one side and force ruled by a mind on the other. Even John grants me that in our age I had the moral right to choose the course I've chosen. I'm doing just what he is doing, only in my own way. He is withdrawing man's spirit from the looters. I'm withdrawing the products of man's spirit. He is depriving them of reason, I'm depriving them of wealth. He is draining the soul of the world, I'm draining its body. 
His is the lesson they have to learn, only I'm impatient and I'm hastening their scholastic progress. But like John, I'm simply complying with their moral code and refusing to grant them a double standard at my expense, or at Reardon's expense, or at yours. What are you talking about? About a method of taxing the income taxers. All methods of taxation are complex, but this one is very simple because it's the naked essence of all the others. Let me explain it to you. She listened. She heard a sparkling voice reciting in the tone of a dryly meticulous bookkeeper a report about financial transfers, bank accounts, income tax returns, as if he were reading the dusty pages of a ledger, a ledger where every entry was made by means of offering his own blood as the collateral to be drained at any moment, at any slip of his bookkeeping pen. As she listened, she kept seeing the perfection of his face, and she kept thinking that this was the head on which the world had placed a price of millions for the purpose of delivering it to the rot of death. The face she had thought too beautiful for the scars of a productive career. She kept thinking numbly, missing half his words. The face too beautiful to risk. Then it struck her that his physical perfection was only a simple illustration, a childish lesson given to her in crudely obvious terms, on the nature of the outer world, and on the fate of any human value in a subhuman age. Whatever the justice or the evil of his course, she thought, how could they? No, she thought, his course was just, and this was the horror of it, that there was no other course for justice to select, that she could not condemn him, that she could neither approve nor utter a word of reproach. And the names of my customers, Miss Taggart, were chosen slowly, one by one. I had to be certain of the nature of their character and career. On my list of restitution, your name was one of the first. She forced herself to keep her face expressionlessly tight, and she answered only, I see. Your account is one of the last left unpaid. It is here at the Mulligan Bank to be claimed by you on the day when you join us. I see. Your account, however, is not as large as some of the others, even though huge sums were extorted from you by force in the past twelve years. You will find, as it is marked on the copies of your income tax returns, which Mulligan will hand over to you, that I have refunded only those taxes which you paid on the salary you earned as operating vice president, but not the taxes you paid on your income from your Tiger transcontinental stock. You deserved every penny of that stock, and in the days of your father I would have refunded every penny of your profit. But... Under your brother's management, Tiger Transcontinental has taken its share of the looting. It has made profits by force, by means of government favors, subsidies, moratoriums, directives. You were not responsible for it. You were, in fact, the greatest victim of that policy. But I refunded only the money which was made by pure productive ability, not the money, any part of which was loot, taken by force. I see. They had finished their breakfast. Donna Schuld lighted a cigarette and watched her for an instant through the first jet of smoke, as if he knew the violence of the conflict in her mind. Then he grinned at Galt and rose to his feet. I'll run along, he said. My wife is waiting for me. What? she gasped. My wife, he repeated gaily, as if he had not understood the reason of her shock. Who is your wife? Kay Ludlow. The implications that struck her were more than she could bear to consider. When? When were you married? Four years ago. How could you show yourself anywhere long enough to go through a wedding ceremony? We were married here by Judge Narragansett. How can... She tried to stop, but the words burst involuntarily, in helpless, indignant protest, whether against him, fate, or the outer world, she could not tell. How can she live through eleven months of thinking that you at any moment might be... She did not finish. He, he was smiling, but she saw the enormous solemnity of that which he and his wife had needed to earn their right to this kind of smile. She can live through it, Miss Taggart, because we do not hold the belief that this earth is a realm of misery where man is doomed to destruction. We do not think that tragedy is our natural fate, and we do not live in chronic dread of disaster. We do not expect disaster until we have specific reason to expect it, and when we encounter it, we are free to fight it. It is not happiness, but suffering, that we consider unnatural. 
It is not success but calamity that we regard as the abnormal exception in human life. 